Hello, uh, I'm Tony Jacoba. We are on uh, Get One, and today I'm going to present you uh, the case concerning uh, external analysis. So it's a moment where you can uh, see and try to figure out if you understand. Hey, uh, did, did I get it? Uh, did I get it perfectly? What are the mistakes that I uh, have done, and so on, and so on? So this is the reason why I, I recommend to to have a look. At the uh, Brenner website, I recommend to have a look on uh, the global situation in Brazil. Uh, that's as I recommend as well. Uh, you to move back to the to the tool before uh, trying to solve it and trying to figure out what are the best uh, issues. So in the case we're, we're considering the entrance of uh, Renault in Brazil in the 90s and. Uh, uh, Beginning of the uh, 2000, and trying to figure out until what extent uh, the way they enter this market can be used for other sectors, what can, what are the limit of this expansion, and so on and so on. So, first of all, just to give you some insight before entering uh, into the case, uh, literally speaking, uh, I would say that it's important to, to remember that uh, at the moment of uh, 2003, uh, Nissan acquired 44% of uh, Renault acquired 44% of Nissan, and uh, Nissan acquired 15% of uh, Renault. However, something that has to be taken into consideration is that if Nissan is a big player, is a big fish within this uh, alliance, uh, the exclusive the writing votes are for Renault, and uh, Nissan has no voting rights. Why did we manage to to this point? Well, basically because uh, Nissan has uh, lots of difficulties at the financial level, uh, even if it was uh, an excellent engineering company. So when we look at the numbers, and it's true, you've got huge difference. Because uh, just to come back to uh, to the point, I'll just come back to the pointer. Here we are. So when when you compare, for instance, in terms of um, black, if, if you compare in terms of revenues. Uh, Renault's numbers and Nissan uh, almost half. Uh, in terms of net income, you can see the same issues. Uh, nevertheless, you can see workforce is the same. So here you can see here you can uh, understand why there's such a problem. Uh, on top of that, what is quite interesting to to note is that, uh, and, and this is quite interesting because when we consider Renault, Renault was trying to acquire some of the companies at lots of cash, but uh, after the failure of the acquisition of Volvo, nobody wanted to work with the French, and uh, well, well, they were really too, too arrogant and so on, and because nobody wanted to work with them for uh, to acquire the and Nissan to say, well, it was, or you bankrupt or you go with the French, so it's, it's quite interesting to look at it. On the other hand, just to explain the position of Renault, it's, it's quite interesting to see that at this point, they uh, they were much more focusing on a Korean company because it looked impossible for for uh, for any French uh, company to acquire a Japanese group or even for an American company it has been always difficult to acquire such a company from uh, you know such uh, heavy weight within uh, the Japanese industry. So this is the reason why it was uh, as well as lots of doubt uh, concerning the ability of French to to go for it. And uh, it's really interesting to see that the uh, success of Carlos Ghost uh, as a CEO of Nissan first and uh, current CEO of uh, Renault uh, is, is really impressive in that sense. So you can see that Renault is a high interest because not everybody knows it. It's a company that, uh, that includes uh, several brands apart from uh, Nissan, obviously. You've got uh, Romanian company uh, Dacia, a low cost of uh, Renault. Yeah. And Samsung Motors, the Korean companies that we were referring to uh, later on. So, uh, what's up when we are considering uh, this alliance in terms of uh, geographical synergies? What can we say? Well, it works perfectly. Why? Uh, because when you look at it, where is uh, Renault strong and where is Nissan strong? When we look at Renault, it, it's uh, just moving here. To go whoops, it's here in this is this is Renault uh, and above all in Latin America. This is Renault. Okay. You say hey, but it says it's uh, they mentioned that uh, uh, Nissan is the most bigger in uh, uh, in Latin America. Watch out, Nissan is strong in Mexico 
and uh, so I'm saying so. In Mexico is integrated when we're talking about the automotive industry within North America. Really important that you uh, pay attention. And on the other hand, just going to change color, uh, just to be sure that you can uh, you can get it. Uh, we're going to move. Uh, go on color, and we're going to put blue. So uh, on its sides, it's uh, Nissan is really strong. Asia and North America. So I would see and for Nissan. So here at this point, it's uh, it seems obvious to to see something and uh, that you need to pay lots of attention, which is uh, in terms of growth. Uh, well, basically, Renault did a fantastic move because they are acquiring a company. Uh, that is in the most dynamic markets, Asia and uh, and North America. Meanwhile, Renault in, in Europe at this point it was not so obvious it will work out. But uh, uh, by the way, we all know that there are the prices later on. But so it, it's really interesting to to look at it. So here, when when we are entering and trying to figure out key success drivers for uh, the uh, sector, it's important to note that uh, obviously. Uh, an automotive company is dependent on the environment, so growth, uh, new type of demands, always more interest in terms of security, ecological uh, vehicles, uh, paying lots of attention to uh, to automotive is no more an issue concerning status. So you can see these elements need to be pointed out. Renault saw them, was quite in advance of, uh, about them, managed to integrate it in concept car. Uh, but the, the big deal is uh, due to the pressure that exists on, on, in the market. So this is more in terms of market. What can we say? Well, we can say that uh, some issues that you must understand. First, the automotive sector is integrating uh, innovation at a huge pace. Before there was one model every two, three years, after one model uh, a year. Now we uh, competitors uh, in the sector, they need to be able to involve several models, several uh, per year. And it's even more difficult to get through the differentiation when you take into consideration that the number of platforms has been decreasing. So how will you manage to say what type of car is it? So uh, you will see that more models, but less differentiation among the model. Okay, we all know that they've got uh, four wheels and so on and so on. But I'm going even further. Uh, if you look at, if you contrast the model, you can see that you've got lots of cooperation among manufacturers, uh, just to divide the cost uh, of innovation. Because if you, uh, it costs a huge amount of money just to uh, just to be involved in. Okay, so at this point, uh, it, it's quite interesting to to go uh, to go uh, and see how it works, and in that sense. You have something that is quite peculiar concerning, uh, uh, let's say, all these markets that you've around is a specific uh, situation within uh, the Brazilian uh, market. And we're going to, to move to this to uh, let you explain uh, what are the key uh, variables to be taken into consideration from this point of view. Okay, so uh, how is it? Well, in Brazil, Despite all the players are represented everywhere, we are only four players. This is the reason why we're talking about Big Four: GM, Ford, Fiat, and Volkswagen. The three major ones uh, being Fiat, GM, and Volkswagen. Ford being only at seven percent. Okay, so this is something that uh, it's really important because if you want to go to Brazil, they say, "Well, how is it possible? You've got more than fifteen players in the world. How is it possible that these four are control it?" Well, basically, they, they've been extremely strong at uh, at showing to the Brazilian that basically, if you want to succeed in Brazil, you need to look Brazilian. And uh, they're quite chauvinistic, uh, more as French. So, uh, really important if you want. You should do this well as possible because if you are aware uh, about the productive uh, model, that existed in Brazil between 1945 until 1982. We're talking about uh, uh, import substitution. Um, basically, uh, uh, there was uh, autarky in uh, Latin America and uh, and among other countries in Brazil, and therefore this explains why this uh, 
families were protected by the arrival of new competitors. In that sense, uh, what they did is that uh, they, they, they felt protected, not so much uh, innovation, not so much uh, uh, differentiation. And so it was really, uh, really well. What happened? Uh, at some point, this is this become a, a problem because uh, the Brazilian government uh, tries to go tries to leverage the economy, and uh, after the crisis of 1982, I just remember on this that basically uh, in 1982 Brazil uh, uh, sorry Mexico made default, and after Mexico, more than 30 countries uh, made default as well. So. Uh, and among them uh, Brazil. So at this point it was really difficult to move on and lots of synergies were developed between government and car makers just to get out of the crisis. Okay, so it was, uh, let's say, uh, 1980s are a point of uh, inflection because just before a huge growth in the, uh, in, in the 70s and we're talking even about Brazilian Latin America, okay? So at this point, it's really, it's really interesting. As soon as the, uh, uh, there's the end of the, uh, well, there's the default in, in Brazil in 1982, uh, so it the end of the dictatorship, movement towards uh, economy, and at some point, in, and this is really interesting to, to look at it, is that after the, uh, the restructuration of the economy that took time, but uh, that happened in, in Brazil, was something that is really important to, to see, is that through the Camara Setorais, uh, the said in Brazilian, uh, which means uh, the agreement between uh, unions, and car makers, and government, they uh, created a new segment, uh, Carlos Populares, uh, and this segment was amazingly uh, successful. Because in just imagine created in 1990s and in 1970s, uh, seven sorry 1970, it represented 70 percent of the world market share of Brazil. So fantastic, uh, great discovery. Uh, but obviously all competitors were looking around, and if, if uh, Brazilian intermediate market becomes attractive, well the issue is. How can other company, how other other company move it? So in this case, uh, Bruno is uh, looks around and trying to see what's up in Brazil. It's important to see that they are leader in Argentina. Uh, the moment where in uh, 1991 uh, was uh, Asuncion Treaty, just uh, the first stages of uh, the regional integration of Mercosur, uh, regional uh, integration agreement between. Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And it's uh, when they look at it, they say, hey, why don't we try to uh, to, to import uh, card uh, to Argentina or to, to export, depending on uh, which point of view you're considering. So uh, it's a tryout uh, from 1983, and they managed to, and despite uh, <laughs> tariffs, they managed to uh, to sell around 15,000 units uh, per year between in 1993, 1994, 1995. So at that point, they say, hey, uh, here there's something that we can do. And uh, Argentina opened four. And uh, so you see, it's you, you, you need to understand and to have a global vision of the sector. And what to say, hey, because it's, it's working pretty well. Uh, and uh, uh, start living in Argentina as a crease. Uh, Orders concerning core uh, have been multiplied by uh, three between 1991 and 1984. So it's it's great. Uh, you can see that uh, it worked out. And uh, basically, uh, in Argentina, a country where there was uh, uh, import substitution as well, uh, basically what happened is that uh, they introduced uh, European design with with the Clio, uh, Twingo, and, and Laguna, and it works. So I just want to say, hey, why don't we copy? Uh, the strategy, uh, but uh, what the difference here is that if we want to get the grants that are linked with uh, the Carlos Populares, we need to put instead of having the normal engine, we we'll put a smaller engine, and as that way we are uh, candidate for the grants, and it will be uh, cheaper for a Brazilian, and they will be hooked by uh, this proposal. Uh, it seems a reasonable option. 
uh, and in 1996 they decide to open the plant in Curitiba. So Curitiba is for for, for those who are not really familiar uh, with Brazil. It's in uh, Paraná state. It's uh, south in southern Brazil, just near Argentina. So you can see just just trying to uh, play on the relationship they've got between. Uh, let's say, between uh, the regional integration synergies. Uh, and above all, because uh, that's to be noted that uh, Paraguay and Uruguay are much smaller, so it's all depending on the relationship between Brazil and Argentina. First car built in 1998 in uh, Curitiba. And uh, let's say that it seems a uh, fantastic success story, because uh, in 2000, they get already 3% of market share, you know, it's fantastic. Well, uh, well, it's a success story. It works, but however, as much in the slide, what can we say? Well, difficulties uh, are increasing. Uh, why? And here, it's it's a moment where it's really interesting to uh, to go to the uh, to the right framework. And the right framework at this point is the five forces. Why? Because when you make the uh, the position, you shouldn't insist on all the variables. I mean, uh, you can say uh, uh, newcomers zero, uh, 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 revolve, intense revolve, revolve four, uh, <coughs> customer, <coughs> they're, they're kind of uh, uh, constrained by uh, the trap uh, in terms of standard of living, providers, completely dependent on, uh, on, on, on existing competitors, and there's no project substitute at this point. So uh, we are completely in, let's say, the framework in which uh, Porter designed its uh, its framework, where basically it's, uh, it's about existing marketplace. And then suddenly, when Renault entered, well, big change. Why? Well, simple. Because if you look, you've got plenty of newcomers, and uh, and the number uh, and these newcomers say, hey, let's copy uh, Renault positioning. So uh, you can see that uh, here, from a strategic point of view, from a sectoral point of view, well, big issue if we insist on this. Obviously, this will in, uh, create lots of uncertainties for uh, the big four first, and Renault does enter because if uh, all the design is copied, well, basically Renault won't get all the dividend it may have. Uh, now let's assume that Renault is not uh, full. And they were uh, aware that some problem of copying their positioning could exist. In that sense, they say, move fast forward, uh, say, uh, it could be uh, fast forward, uh, uh, just to move and trying to uh, to get into it, to get the strong market share, benefiting from the fact that in Brazil, uh, uh, so, uh, retail network is open which is a bit uh, a, a trick because to a certain extent it's open but most of the time the existing players they they have some special treatment with, uh, with the retailer and this is the reason why even if they put the new cars they do not necessarily sell it so uh, keep it in mind because if it happens to you if you go to Brazil really important to, to know this type of issues so uh, this is let's say sectoral level if we uh, take into consideration uh, best of well, uh, political, economical issues, it, it's, it's, it's becoming really complex because yeah, you say, hey, uh, if you're at economical level, you've got devaluation of the real, and the uh, political level, they didn't uh, comment anything to uh, the Argentine partner. You can imagine that they get a bit mad about it. Uh, they get mad because they were not respected. Two second mad because uh, one third of uh, Argentine export are going to Brazil, so basically value of export moving down, provoking a uh, small crash, and no surprise at the end, uh, what should happen has happened because uh, there was a uh, devaluation of the peso. What is the problem? Well, in uh, uh, the Argentine peso was, uh, and this is a big, big, big problem, uh, was paid to the dollar. In the convertibility uh, world, and since 1991, because in Argentina they had a huge inflation uh, from the 1980s, they didn't know what to do to, uh, to give some legitimacy to their currency. And at this point, well, they, uh, they don't know what to do. So, uh, there was what has been uh, called the Coralito, 
which means that basically uh, in order to avoid the bank rent from uh, all the uh, people that deposit, bank were closed and uh, let's say that uh, people that have saving would see how the saving were losing money day after day without having the opportunity to, to go to the bank. So it was terrific issues and um, and obviously, what uh, the consequence of, of these issues was, and America's were in recession. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, it's uh, it's a big deal because uh, you can imagine foreign oil is really complex, uh, and uh, if initially uh, Bruno was able to uh, to change completely uh, the distribution channel. Uh, giving some more specialization to Brazil, to Brazil and giving some more specialization to Argentina. So they, uh, this was the original framework and then they moved to another issue where basically uh, everything was uh, manufactured in Brazil and everything was manufactured in Argentina. Uh, this is, let's say, what happened. So you can imagine that this pressure uh, make uh, you got some winner and some loser. If you get uh, so many constraints on Renault, Renault and the other newcomers uh, are suffering huge constraints. And the big four, they get a great advantage because when you see that uh, more players, less uh, less cars to be sold in a constrained environment. So uh, big four, say, can have, have the option just to force as uh, newcomers to make huge losses. First in Brazil, and second to prevent them from uh, having some success in other uh, in other countries. Uh, so this is something really really interesting. Okay, so if we look more carefully uh, at Renault's experience in, in Brazil, uh, overall using five forces, what can we say? Uh, first, it, it's uh, just. Uh, Putting an emphasis on five forces again, uh, in case you, you forget it, is that um, you should you should not always consider all the five uh, elements. Here, providers irrelevant, uh, uh, product substitution uh, irrelevant, clients really important. When you go to Brazil, it's uh, you need to uh, to uh, to make uh, your product national. It has to be uh, Brazilian, so in that sense, Renault use uh, really good, uh, understood the Brazilian market. They got involved in the Brazilian carnival. Uh, they had uh, Ayrton Senna as a driver of Formula One. Uh, problem, they were, again, it's lucky at the beginning and lucky afterwards because when uh, Senna died with the Renault car, obviously, it's a big pain for, uh, for Renault's uh, strategic expansion. And, and here is point. It's a real issue concerning and this framework. It's about a uh, when you look at this, this is a tier. At this point, you got zero, and uh, afterward, in a year, you got four. So this is, this is the initial situation. When we move to uh, the second uh, case, I'm just going to uh, so I'm just maybe to put it here first. Uh, this is in. Uh, I'm going to write it down. I'm going to write it down. Let's see if, I, if it works. Oops. So it's in 19. Oops. Oops. In 1990. Oops. And if we move uh, to uh, to another year, what happened? We're going to see that we go on zero. We're going to uh, figure out on. Uh, I'm going to pretend to use another color. And uh, if we go later on, what happened when we are in 2003? Uh, you've got uh, new companies. You got Renault that was a move in here. This was the existing for. But you've got 11 newcomers plus the big four that are introducing uh, their, their European range of products. So, as you can imagine, it's big, big uh, difficulties for uh, for them. At this point, what, uh, what has to be taken into consideration is that uh, Renault was aware it has to go faster, faster, 
but it's uh, it's a big uh, issues in terms of uh, community resources and capabil uh, resources because you need to uh, improve a lot their capabilities uh, for Brazil and by this change it's completely different okay so if we look again what can we say first you've got the concept that was coined by uh, Arnaldo Axe I'm going to write it uh, here Oops. From the from the MIT, uh, where it says that uh, basically you got uh, market locked in by four players in uh, 1996, and uh, industrial policy. So the government can be a big player to uh, change this policy, uh, uh, renew social opportunity, get into it. Open the problem is uh, the policy is general, so lots of players get aware about it, and basically uh, it works out. The problem is because of the crisis, uh, the, the openings that was done by government, uh, government sector uh, and uh, unions get back in favor of the big four that can leverage their uh, previous uh, range of product above all for. Uh, low uh, low range products. So this is the reason why they managed to lock in against this market and, uh, and this is the reason why even if Renault's market share went up to 5% it moved down to 4%. Okay, so uh, this is it. If you want to, to enjoy you've got uh, plenty of ads uh, concerning uh, Renault's expansion, uh, Renault's ad and and reward. You have something that uh, you will love at is uh, it's just uh, how, how it's possible with very uh, personally uh, some uh, uh, example of the, of uh, Ayrton Senna great races.